Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Again, welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. As you can see, I have this photo of this gentleman that has been with us uh, over probably about a couple of shows at this point in time, Baruti Artery, and it's really been a pleasure uh, as far as this interview is concerned, you know, in all due, all due respect, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And so now we have a, a, a third show, and, and I thought it would be an, a, a, an opportunity, if you will, for Baruti to, to be able to express himself from the standpoint of where are we going to be going from here? Uh, and I think that's very, very important. And maybe he might possibly, for, the, for those of you who, have, who weren't, weren't privy to the first two shows, I might ask him to do, maybe do a little recap, if you will, of some of the things that he, he felt were, were more highlighted, if you will, to give you some sense of perspective. This is not a personal attack, if you will. This is just how we do business here in this area. And it's unfortunate that, that, that these things have happened to us. But it's not necessarily just Baruti, but it's many folks that looks like Baruti, if you will. In fact, I even fall in that same class. And, mm. and I, so we wanna, I really want to thank him, and we really want to appreciate the fact that the, the last two shows and this particular show, and, and uh, uh, this is something that will be a benefit. For. But if you notice, like I said, I, I showed you this photo, and I, I wanted you to know that um, he wasn't just the average Joe Blow, if you will. Uh, this guy has background. He has history. Uh, he has family. Uh, I mean, he has history from the standpoint of the kinds of things that, that, as far as I'm concerned, is an example, if you will, for many African-American males. Mm -hmm. Because that's basically a lot of times you, you tend not to get the more positives about uh, African-American males and giving them the role models that they necessarily need. Well, here is a role model. But then at the same time, here's a role model that hit a glass ceiling mm -hmm. as a result to an incident that, uh, uh, that we felt was very, was, was just terrible. But anyway. But we'll get into that, too. But, Rudy, welcome again. Good. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I'm glad to have this opportunity to be back on Oregon Voters Digest. I really do appreciate the other two shows. Uh, I've gotten great feedback on just the truth that was laid out there. And I've mm -hmm. learned there's a lot of people in this community and around the country that I would call truth seekers. They want to know the truth. Yes. They want to know the story behind the story. So I feel really good about the way that that has come out. I, I thank you. And I also, I've been wanting to give a shout out to both of our good friends. And Greg Benton. Yes, As you oh, know, yes. Greg played an important part Very of me so. coming on the first show. And Greg is a brother I've known since the 70s. Uh, he's a warrior. And, Very much uh, so. And I just appreciate him uh, in helping me to uh, be focused and pursuing this opportunity to lay all this out to you. Mm -hmm. Also, if I may, Bruce, I'd like to just give a couple of shout outs. Please. You know, I always like to do no, a shout no out up front. Uh, yes. This is kind of the thing we do. Uh, the first one is I got to give my son a shout out. The last time yeah. I was here, I gave my grandson a shout out it was his 14th, 14th birthday well friday was my son's birthday he turned 36 and his name is hassan arthur uh and also for those of you right here in the portland oregon area you may have seen an article in the scanner newspaper that uh he is now on kidney dialysis and he is looking for a kidney donor uh he has a hereditary kidney disease and so we're all uh, very much supporting him and again that's one of the reasons i made my decision to transition from working into retirement. So happy birthday, son. Um, and also when I speak of kidney transplant, it, it, it made me think of uh, former city commissioner, parks director, Charles Jordan. Mm. And for those of you from afar, Charles Jordan was a much beloved elected official uh, who was the first African American that served on the Portland City Council. And he passed away in the last week or so. But uh, I thought about Charles because he uh, mentored a lot of people and, and really mm -hmm. did a great job with the Parks Bureau. But he also did a great job of being a role model of what leadership is, yeah, especially yeah. as a black person mm -hmm. in this community, uh, again, in Portlandia. And the one thing I remember that Charles did for me, when I was the deputy director of the Portland Development Commission, and Charles Moose was the police chief here yeah, in Portland, gentlemen. and Charles Moose is the gentleman who went on and was involved in the D.C sniper incident and helped to track down the uh, s suspects in that particular shooting. But Charles was police chief 
uh, Charles Moose, that is, and Charles Jordan at that time running the city's Parks Bureau. Mm -hmm. And I was the deputy director with the Portland Development Commission. And I remember Charles Jordan pulling Moose and I together to have breakfast downtown in the heart of Portland. And he said, it is important that people see us together. It is important that mm -hmm. people know that we are supporting each other and that we have each other's back. So as a result, we continued to meet for breakfast on a periodic basis. And I shared with Charles uh, that my ex at that time was going through her own challenges with a kidney dialysis. And Charles Jordan and Charles Moose, uh, they were part of the genesis of an organization called Family of One that mm. became an organization that uh, uh, sought to increase awareness among African Americans about organ donation. Uh, we also testified in the legislature about how to improve uh, the technical assistance in kidney dialysis units, making sure there was money in the state budgets for inspections and that technicians were required to meet certain criteria in order to serve people. So I just want to, again, and there's many stories about uh, former Commissioner Charles Jordan and what he's done for so many people, especially our children, that for me personally, I will always remember him as a mentor mm -hmm. and someone who just uh, really stepped up and was an example of leadership and how to work together and how to support each other and how to watch each other's back. Just another point in regards to your donor situation. First off, your phone number, and two, uh, it's my understanding that a donor could be anybody of any race for that matter. Just yes. type O blood, right? Just that type is correct. O blood, right? My son is a type O, and, and so there's actually, there's, there's what they're called five integers that okay. they look for when they do a kidney match, and blood is one of those, and you have to have at least three matches in the integers, and so, but blood type, type O is one, and if anyone is interested in being considered yes, for a potential number. kidney donation, email me. Okay. Baruti A at Comcast.net. Baruti A at Comcast.net. If you're on Facebook, there's a Facebook site called A Kidney for Hassan. Uh, Hassan is the father of four kids. He has four sons. And until he gets a transplant, he'll be on kidney dialysis. Yeah. And his mom received a kidney 15 years ago after being on dialysis. And it mm -hmm. really was a major difference in her life mm -hmm. and so we're looking to him for him to have the same type of success and and i appreciate the chance to put that out there yeah. for the viewing audience good and in case just in case if you if you have any problems getting access to the rudy or resources you can give me a call 503-701-0457 and i'll get that information to you good. thank you okay, fine, sure. and, and and if i may too and when i thought about leadership in portland i thought about charles jordan and this is how the continuum of thought went it started with my son needing a transplant and then it made me think about family of one that caused me to think about charles jordan mm -hmm. and the other folks it led me to really think about uh were former state senator bill mccoy yeah, bill. and his bill wife gladys yeah. mccoy oh, who was uh uh, uh, the former chair of the Multnomah County Commission, mm -hmm. uh, the former chair of the school board, yep. I think the first African American to serve in either capacity. Mm -hmm. And I just think about uh, leadership, and I just remember talking with them, and they told me as a young person, to, ho to whom much is given, much is expected. Yes. And they were just, again, role models and examples. So a shout out to their family, yes. because right. this happens to be the month that we lost. Gladys McCoy. Yes, and so right. I know for the family, the month of April is always yes. a challenge. And so a shout out to you and to all the kids and all the grandkids that are out there now. And Paul would appreciate that. Yes, Paul, Paul McCoy, McCoy yeah. Paul McCoy. Yes, and, yeah. others, and the kids. Yes, and all of them. Uh, and if I may, Bruce, uh, what I want to do is to follow up on your question about where do we go from here? Yes, you know, right. I, I, I've been, uh, for those of you who know me and have seen me talk the last couple of shows, I've been very passionate about this issue that I called political drive-by. Uh, and I'll explain more of what a political drive-by in case some of you didn't see the first two <laughs> shows. But I've been very passionate about it. And folks who have known me a long time, they said, Baruti, you've done a good job of explaining uh, why you're passionate. And, uh, uh, but some folks said, well, Baruti, uh, you're so passionate that you come off like an angry black man. And I was, I was taken back by that <laughs> because I know for a fact that if I was a white man sitting here, they would say he is filled with righteous indignation <laughs> for justifiable reasons related to this political drive-by. Mm. So it's not my intent to come off as an mm. angry black man. My goal is to share information 
and knowledge so that the people in this community, those people who are voters, those people who are taxpayers, can better assess how you make your decisions in the selection of leaders and what type of leaders that we're putting in place. And to me, it doesn't matter, black, white, yellow, red, or brown, you know, there are certain standards of leadership related mm -hmm. to integrity uh, uh, and, and to uh, having uh, transparency and being accountable, that that's the very basic where we have to start. Mm -hmm. So when I shared the story about <clears throat> being a victim of a political drive-by, uh, the story that I shared, I'm going to try to be very brief on this. I don't want to go back and rehash yeah, this, right. but it was a situation where I called uh, a black woman who happens to be county commissioner, county commissioner Loretta Smith. I referred to her as beautiful at an introduction at an informal reception uh, uh, that was held last year, last June. Uh, my use of the term beautiful was turned into uh, a embarrassing remark. It was turned into a, a, a lead sexual harassment. And I was very, very taken back by this. And um, Long story short, the more I looked into this, I felt like there were other people who were involved in this and involved in embellishing this for their own personal reasons. And that's why I use the term political drive-by. It wasn't exactly as it was portrayed in the press. It wasn't as uh, it was reported. And there were a number of people who had other uh, ulterior motives uh, around political retribution towards me because I had the audacity to hold them accountable for whatever jobs, positions that they were in. And as I said on the previous show, there's a lot of black folks in this community that have applauded me when I go downtown to speak truth to power. But some of those same black folks, when I turn and look at them and say, well, you need to be accountable for what you're doing, whatever your position is. And it didn't matter to me uh, if it was Roy J. Harris and mm -hmm. his nonprofit organizations that he's out raising money for. I look for accountability. It didn't matter to me if it was city commissioner Nick Fish and the way he was running his bureaus and the way he was responding to concerns involving African-American employees. It made no difference to me if it was former state senator Margaret Carter and her position as president of the Urban League. Uh, there was this, uh, a requirement of accountability, and it's no different than the accountability that I have held on myself and that I've learned through my career that if you're going to be successful, there's accountability. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I think I would say related to this drive-by, uh, on the second show, I talked about the motivations behind folks. And it's hard to prescribe motivations on mm -hmm. folks. But the thing that struck me was that the people who participated in this, uh, for the large part, were people who, for whatever reasons, felt like they needed to, to lie, steal, and, uh, and, 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 and kill and destroy. And I was taken back, and a part of it is, is when people don't feel, when they have a sense of inadequacy and they don't feel that they're prepared enough themselves to compete, they're looking for ways to cheat the system. And I was just saying, hey, you gotta be accountable. And so here I was as a public servant doing the job that I was appointed to. And some of this was as chair of the Urban League Board. Uh, some of this was in various positions I've had with the state, with the city, where I've crossed swords with people. And doing my job as a public service, protecting the public interest, protecting the public resources, and then to allow a group of people, a small group of people, be that. And this isn't about a large group of people, just a small group of evil people mm -hmm. to go out and start to assassinate my character and my name behind uh, a bunch of fabrication. And so what it did for me, having gone through that, I had to take a step back. Oh, and let me also say, too, uh, when I talk about this, this is so interesting. When I mentioned that reception that took place, uh, people have heard me talk about it, mm -hmm. some of the people who were there. And as I mentioned, it was about 40 people there, and 30 of the 40 people, or 30 plus, have contacted me and said they were shocked, they were stunned, they didn't believe anything really happened. And, and then that led to a lot of other questions. How come someone I knew for over 30 years didn't reach out and contact me personally? How come these other people who participated in the driveway, drive by, never reached out to contact me personally to ask any questions. They just took the opportunity to assassinate my character. Mm -hmm. And so if part of it is, it's like uh, one comedian said, what do you mean don't kick a person when he's down? Uh, that's when it's most convenient. He's right down there by your foot, you know, so go ahead and kick him. And so what happens in Portland is that when somebody thinks you're down, yeah. and that's when the cowards jump in and decide to give you a good swift kick because yeah. they feel they got you at a disadvantage.
So one of the things that I've decided to do as a result of everything that I've said, because I realize even though I've spent two hours and this is the third hour we've had this right, discussion, right, there is so much information and there's so much background that I've decided I need to do some things differently as an individual mm -hmm. that will not only help to address the issues and concerns I've talked about, but would also start to better educate and inform the young people in our community yeah. on how to maneuver when you're living in the number one city preferred by white folks, when you're living in a city that's 75 percent white and you're living in a city that to a large part that uh, folks can take shots at you, can ridicule you with impunity and don't feel that there's any accountability. And then you've got certain selected uh, who I've called house Negroes who have a vested interest who will chime in and also take their opportunity to give you kicks because you don't go along to get along with them. Mm -hmm. So so the first thing I did was after I went through this and after I've had the first two shows to get some of this off my chest, as you know, Bruce, I was pretty hot. Yeah, it was pretty yeah, yeah. hot. And so, right so you, the show. you yeah, right and I appreciate you giving me right the chance the to verbalize it and get it out. And 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 nothing I've said I haven't written about. And all of this is has been something that I been writing about and part of it is because I said that uh, what's happened in the last year or so uh, since this incident it's just another chapter in my life you know it's mm -hmm. not my life story it's not the highlight of what I've done and where I've been and when you've come on and you've articulated the positions I've held the civic uh, awards I've received, uh, the education that I've had, and also the background, where mm -hmm. I came from, how I've gone through that, uh, the mentorship awards. And when you talk about that, then you're talking about me and my life. And I have, on the other hand, again, there's a few uh, folks in this community who don't know me, never talked to me, or maybe had a three minute phone conversation with me, and they wanna set me up and take shots at me. But it's all part of this bigger, uh, plantation mm -hmm. mentality that I'll come back to. Mm -hmm. But but this is the one thing I want to share with you. This is mm -hmm. how it has impacted me. Because uh, prior to this happening, as I was uh, going into my position with the mayor, I was really looking at this as an opportunity to kind of close out my working career and uh, do a good job. And I was in a great position in public safety because I didn't have a vested interest in worrying about getting a promotion. I didn't have a, a vested interest uh, in terms of having to appease anybody uh, other than just trying to make sure I'm doing the job and doing it well. And I had, uh, I believe, the respect of people, as we say, on both sides of the river here in Portland, because downtown is on one side, the community is on the other, and people trusted me because I've been an honest broker in the 40 years I've been in this community. And so uh, I went into the position feeling like I was going to do that, and then eventually I would transition out of there and, and start to slow down and, and take it real easy. But now, after this happened, Bruce, I'm not I'm taking it easy. I'm not slowing down. Oh, yeah. I said, uh, now, and I ain't going nowhere. You know, I've yeah. talked about how much fun I have when I go to California and I'm at the beach and I'm cruising in my old school car and, and I'm going to the old school parties and, and enjoying the various churches there and enjoying the variety of food and entertainment and being close to my family and being in the sun. Well, all that can wait. Because right now, I feel like uh, until some of this gets sorted out here, I just, again, cannot be comfortable. So I'm not going anywhere. Good. I'm going to be more vocal. I'm going to be more visible. I'm going to be holding more people accountable. And, and this is how I'm going to do it. The first thing is I have a good friend who uses the term called returnment. Returnment. And it, returnment. Oh, and returnment is for those folks who have moved into the transition of retirement, but they're not ready to quit working. Mm. So they look for an opportunity of how can they return, return back to a position to give something to the community. Okay. So I'm working through my returnment, and part of my returnment is figuring out how on an intergenerational level, as African American leaders and elders, we can make sure we're doing the best job possible to support those young people who are coming up in this okay. community, uh, those who have moved here from other places in professional capacities. Because if you come to Portland, I thought about this, and if you're a professional black person, Person, you are a trailblazer. 
Yes. You are a trailblazer <laughs> still. Huge, huge. In 2014, you are a trailblazer. If you're African American, almost any other color, and you come to Portland and you're a professional. And the reason is because, again, the white folks love it when we say the trailblazers are the ones on the basketball court and they cheer for them up and down. They love them and, and all of that. So they're comfortable seeing us playing basketball. They love us when we're doing the music and we have the jazz stuff, mm -hmm. we have the blues stuff, and we have all our music and they're loving us. But when we transition from the sports arena and the entertainment arena into the political arena into the mm. business arena it's like oh wait a minute you know it's like that's not something they're used to seeing and so it creates a whole different dynamic and how we as African Americans maneuver and present ourselves in that arena is very important because some folks are able to do that and maintain who they are and their identity and and be able to do their jobs and other folks move into that arena and they become traitors to the community yeah. they become traitors to the black folks, traders to the community, and traders to the race, because they are trading in who they are for some personal gain, some personal benefit, and they will sell you out and sell out any other person, mm -hmm. so they can get their personal gain out of that. So they become the traders in mm -hmm. the community. And this is why I keep going back to this mm -hmm. plantation mentality, mm -hmm. is that if some of this stuff is just right out of the plantation in terms of how the white folks deal with the blacks and the black folks deal with each other and all of this, I say it's a plantation mentality. So part of my retirement is that number one, I'm going to start doing some education series. Mm -hmm. I've already been contacted by two different organizations who have asked me after seeing uh, the various shows. They said, we need somebody to start teaching our people about courageous leadership mm -hmm. and how to speak up and how to step up. And I was very taken back by that because what you see is what you get with me. I don't consider it courageous leadership. I consider it just plain leadership, doing the right thing. And so, and this goes all the way back again from my days going up in the hood through the public sector and all of that. That uh, uh, my mentor, who I mentioned when I worked at Boise Cascade for 15 years, was a gentleman named Pete Norrie. And I mentioned how all these MBAs from Harvard and Stanford and Chicago uh, took me under the wing and would groom me, and how I would sit down with them mm -hmm. in sales and marketing meetings and travel around the country negotiating multi million dollar deals. Well, one of the things Pete told me way back then, he said, Baruti, he said, whatever you do, he said, don't ever lose that ability to stand up in a room full of people and say bullshit. He said, because you are not intimidated by people's titles uh, or the level of their education or the wealth that they bring mm -hmm. into the room. It's like, you know, bullshit is bullshit. Yes, Somebody's right, got to right, stand right. up and call it. And so that's one of the things. It's nothing. So what I've done here is so different than what I've been doing my entire career. So I've been asked about teaching courageous leadership. And interesting enough, one of the groups that's talked to me is a primarily uh, Caucasian group. <laughs> and say teaching their white people in terms of of how to do courageous leadership. I thought that was interesting. Another has a focus more on African Americans. So I'm committed, number one, to do some education mm -hmm. and to do some training. And I also would offer this up to, you know, we got all these black organizations out there that are working on so many issues in our community around housing and health care. Uh, uh, education mm -hmm. and jobs and uh, equal opportunity in so many mm -hmm. other arenas. And so here I am right now, and I'm going to say I will make myself available to those organizations that have a focus in trying to improve the livability for African Americans in this community with a specific focus on talking about the issue of leadership. How do we develop it? How do we define it? How do we identify it? And how do we challenge it? And how do we hold people accountable for leadership? So this is a shout out to uh, the Urban League, the African American Alliance, uh, to POW, to the NAACP, to the Coalition of Black Men, the African American Alliance uh, for uh, Home Ownership, the African American Alliance for Healthcare, all the sororities, all the fraternities, the links, all y'all. And to the churches, the churches that are talking about truth, standing on truth, and how do we continue to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word too? Because when I look at it, you know, the Bible says very well that he who spread falsehood should not go unpunished. And the Bible says very 
very clearly that the devil comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. And by the way, I put on my best bow tie because we're into the Easter season. And for those of us in the church, this is Happy Resurrection Day coming up. So I just want to get that shout in because I feel like I should be able to say mine just like other folks. You know, other folks can come in and say I'm an atheist and everybody says, oh, that's okay. But, you know, and so I feel like I'm just not going to let folks deny me and define me and tell me what I can do, what I can't do, what I can be and what I can't say. So, yes, so I'm here. So I'm going to be doing one on my retirement. Uh, I'm going to be doing education and I'm education programs, too. And I already have a speakers bureau. It's called uh, Northwest Speakers Bureau that I'm negotiating with, uh, representing me to go out and do speaking engagements. And three, I'm finally motivated to finish my memoirs because you really? heard me reference some yeah, of the things did. I've said. You this did. is going to be in that. my you're memoirs. Do this. You're do and this. so even before I went into the mayor's <laughs> office, I already was working on this life story about having grown up in Compton and Watts and then coming to Oregon and attending Linfield College right. uh, with a one-way ticket when I was 17 years old and going to Linfield College and attending school there. There, sitting in the classroom with some of the same kids from the uh, Southern California area, Bel, Bel Air and uh, Brentwood, places that my mama used to take me to clean houses. My mother was yeah. a domestic worker, and I'd go and help clean their houses. But anyway, and tell my story in terms of how I went to Linfield. I even thought about you. you from Texas. Yes, and I said, that's where my parents are from. They're from Texas. I need to tell the story how as a young person going to Texas and still seeing the white only signs up and the that's colored right. only signs up, tell the story of how my parents, my grandparents, they took me and my three brothers to the cotton field. We didn't yes. pick cotton, we pulled cotton. And if you're from Texas, you know what the difference yeah, I is. I pulled and pick. You pulled and pick. Well, I'm sorry for you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled cotton for three days with two of my brothers. No way. And I never will forget this. We worked our tails off. And at the end of those three days, we made $11. I and I good. said $11. I and good. I was like, we only got $11 each. They said, no, that's $11 for all three of y'all. Right. So, so anyway, I want to tell that story. I I'm gonna tell the story of getting it, out of Linfield and, yes, and going yeah. to work in corporate America, Boise Cascade, being the only person of color in the sales force nationally when I started there in 1974. And some of the challenges that I had to overcome in dealing with people both inside and outside the corporation. And some of the issues I ran against when I had customers who wouldn't even wanna to talk to me because I was a person mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. you know, And had managers who didn't want me on their team because mm -hmm. they worked on a bonus program and having a person of color might impact their, their sales and their bonus. And I had to work through some of that. And then to leave Boise Cascade and go into a family business, uh, African-American business, and to go work nationally, as I thought about it. And when my, we did defense contractings, we down in the South, Tennessee, Alabama, Louisiana. You know, we working deep in the South. And to go into those meetings and to sit in the room with these folks representing the U.S. Defense Department and who will tell you quick, Hey, I'm a good old boy from Alabama, from Mississippi, and you walk in a room and everybody's white. And why should they care about any African-American business and have to go in there and negotiate? But when I went in to negotiate with them, I got to tell the story because I guarantee you when they went home, we had a contract, multi-million dollar contract. We wasn't making money on it. We show up. They want us to just sign the contract for another four years and to operate at a deficit. And I went in and said, hell no, we don't operate like that. Start laying out the numbers, <laughs> running it down to them. And when they raised their voice, I raised my voice. Yes, they pound the yes, table, I pound the yes. table. And I'm sure when they went home, they sat around the table and told their family, said, he ain't from this plantation. <laughs> said, he ain't from this plantation. He don't know how we operate. You're right. They went home. They said, that yellow Negro, where he from? You know, I don't know. But I ain't from that plantation. And so I want to tell the story of how we're doing that and how going to the state and how working for the city and how working in the community to tell those stories. And so I'm going to finish my memoirs. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, that's yeah. it. So I'm going to do important. education. Okay. I'm going to do speakers. I'm going to finish right. my memoirs. I'm going to okay. do a, a cancer awareness. I want to be involved in cancer Turn. awareness. And this is the last thing. This is the last thing. And so I'm going to do cancer awareness. Awareness. And this is the last one, uh, is that people know that for years I've, I've been part of this traveling show, uh, Let's Talk Church, I've done stand-up comedy, yeah. and I love comedy, you know, I think we all need to laugh, and some of the best comedy comes out of tragedy. And I've learned that. So throughout the time I've gone through this major challenge, I've been keeping notes. And, and I've decided I have got to uh, uh, start letting folks know. Because there's already people laughing at Portlandia. You know, folks who are around the country yeah, and yeah, said, right, right, and right. I told you, they said, if you can't call a sister beautiful in Portland? Uh, oh, man, there's a whole lot of jokes Gee. in that. And so I'm going I'm to be on the, I'm going to be doing some open mics. I'm going to do all that. And, and, and so the thing I wanted to say, I talked about sizzle and steak last time. And people say, thank you for explaining the difference between what is sizzle and what is steak. I really appreciate that. I ain't going to go into it. But I also got to start teaching people about the okie doke. 
This is what I learned. People in Portland, white and black folks, they don't know what the okie doke is. And they keep falling <laughs> for the okie doke. See, in the hood, the okie doke was when somebody show you a nice television and then you show up and they give you a box and you take it home and you open it up. Ain't nothing but a bunch of bricks in the box. <laughs> and the people, they laugh, they oh, fell for the okie doke again. <laughs> you know, they fell for the okie doke. But we got people here in Portland who are running the okie doke over and over and black <laughs> folks and white folks don't know how to deal with the yeah, okie doke. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. so when I start teaching, I'm going to teach the unconventional topics. I'm yes. going to teach about the sizzle and steak. I'm going to talk about how to recognize the okie doke. And I'm also going to teach you about rope a doke. Rope a doke, rope -a -dope too. Oh because some of these young folks, I know you know about rope a dope, know rope -a -dope. but some of these folks don't know about rope a dope. And so last year, when I was going through my challenge, folks were looking at me, expecting me to be like a wounded soldier walking around with my head down and hide. I, I walked around with my head up. I said, I ain't hiding. I ain't tucking my tail between my legs. I ain't, you know, say, hey, I'm still me. Folks ain't going to tell me that. They said, well, well how are you going to respond? I said, you know what? I'm doing the I'm doing the rope of dope. Rope of dope. A rope of like dope. That. And I'll like leave that. it at that. <laughs> well, hey, on that particular note, we're gonna take a rope of dope and take a take a little short break. We'll come back for the okie dope. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Again, folks, welcome back again. Uh, I'm sure you're enjoying the interview here that I'm doing with uh, Baruti Atari, and, and it's been very enlightening, if you will. In fact, I'm reminded, Baruti, uh, uh, of, a, of a guy that I used to know back when, when I was a member of Trumpeters, you know, this elite group, if you will, mm -hmm. kind of like Toastmasters and whatever, and Packwoods, folks mm -hmm. like that were part of that deal. But also, uh, Funk Tom McCall, oh, yeah. Tom McCall yeah. was there. And uh, he, I was always interested in the, the statement that he had made in regards to visit, but don't stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then as we sit down and we chatted about this business, he said, Bruce, then there's a difference between staying and living here. Mm. Mm. I'm interested in people mm. who want to live here. Mm. They want to contribute, and the neighborly thing, right. and the, the anti-crime, that kind of a deal. Yeah. Staying here is not folks who are going to be responsible mm -hmm. to do the kinds of things that we're looking for. Yeah. So that's basically how I came out with the statement. He said, he says, I, I, I visit, but don't stay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I adopted that, and I like that idea. Yeah. Then I, yeah. And then that's again, I, I attribute that with you, too, yeah. from that same point. We want you to continue to live here. Well, and I like you, that piece aspect thank you, of it. Okay, sir. Well, thank fine. You, sir. Now, there were some other points there that I was wondering. Yeah. Did we get through in reference to maybe some of the other comments, some of the other little highlights? Would you mind sharing some of those other little points that you made? Well, well. In terms of that, that whole drive-by uh, piece. Okay. okay. Well, the drive-by piece itself, uh, one of the things that the reason I get so passionate about yes. this education, passing on knowledge, because right. what happened, we don't want to see happen in the community. And what I'm proposing is we have to figure out what is the right medicine that we need in our community to adjust some of this illness that we see mm -hmm. in our community. Uh, if I, I also have to share this with you. I right. had uh, a group of pastors ask me, they said, well, can you talk about this stuff without burning the whole house down? <laughs> and, 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 you know, and it was a legitimate question and concern because folks were very concerned as I started to disclose uh, this wickedness and this treachery that uh, a lot of folks would get caught up in the, uh, in, you know, by the fallout from it. And, and I had to, and I thought about it, thought about it. And I said, you know what? I said, this is not burning the house down. What this is, this is more of a situation when you find that you're living in a house and you have termites. 
Now, mm -hmm. you can ignore the termites, but if you do, the termites are going to slowly destroy the infrastructure of the house right. until it falls down around you. Mm -hmm. You also, you can deal with termites now when you find them, and it's going to be less costly or less painful than it's going to be five years, ten years down the road. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, if you had first responded to the termites when you first had an inkling they were there, mm -hmm. is it. So it's not a matter of burning the house down. This is a matter of fumigating the house. So when I talk about education and medicine, that's what it is. And the, and the ed education is the best analogy I keep going back to. Again, it's the plantation mentality because when I read the history books in terms of, of what's impacted our people, and, and we've got this issue of post-traumatic slavery syndrome mm -hmm. that affects both white and black people. And I just as I've traveled around the country and even outside the country, I just can see you continue to see it being played out more right here in Portlandia. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because of the ratio of white folks to people of color. Mm -hmm. So the people who I talked about, just to recap real quick, number one, I mentioned David Austin, who's the public information officer for Multnomah County, and that uh, he certainly played a major role. And, and understandably so, Loretta being a county commissioner, who's the first person she would go to with a story like this, it would be the public information officer who then takes it to the press and the press takes it and they run with it and then the press starts to feed on itself and it turns into a whole different story. And then you bring into the mix someone like Roy J. Harris who again wasn't there and uh, but when he does get involved he comes and and speaks very negatively of me and this is based on having a long history of knowing each other and working together and the only thing I could attribute that to was because I in turn have held him accountable and held his feet to the fire in terms of accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, and I was just very taken back. And I also said, you know, and we can talk more about it, some of the information related to him was overwhelming that came to me from people in the community that also had been victim of drive-bys. And then thirdly, I mentioned uh, the sitting city commissioner, Nick Fish, who I laid out and I think uh, quite a bit of detail as to why I think he took it upon himself without talking to me and talking to the local newspaper and being very critical of whatever the outcome was of the investigation, critical of my behavior without talking to me. And I think that was related to our past involvement when I've just been very candid and direct to him about how I saw that he ran his bureaus, how I saw he dealt with issues of people of color. And I never would have gone out publicly and talked about him or said anything if he didn't participate in this drive-by. Mm -hmm. I have other folks I've had to cross sorts with over the years in terms of differences of opinion or didn't make funding decisions the way they wanted, but I'm not talking about them because they didn't participate in this drive-by. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of other folks here I could say that's not happy with me for the decisions I've made, but when I reflected on it, there's not any of those decisions that I have a second thought about. Mm -hmm. It was the right decision. And even decisions related to these people who attempted this drive-by, when I look over each one them, I wouldn't change anything in terms of the way that uh, that I had to make those decisions for the right reasons. And even if I knew it was going to result in this type of public bashing, I still would have made the decision. You know, I still would have made the decision. And so after Nick Fish was Margaret Carter former state senator, uh, that she's been grumbling ever since I was chair of the board of the Urban League and she was president. And my job very simply was to hold her feet to the fire to get her to do her job. Yeah, you know, when, if you're you making eighty dollars to $90,000 a year, you can't spend all your time, you know, working on legislative issues and not handling the business of the office. Mm -hmm. And some folks on the board just said, Baruti, I'm glad it's you that have to deal with it and not me. Because mm -hmm. some of those folks just didn't have the gumption to be upfront about it. But <laughs> I've, I've never had that problem because, again, it's just about the way I had to grow up. And then lastly is uh, Commissioner Loretta Smith. And I said on the very first show, when I figured out the people who participated in this, uh, this became an issue that wasn't about Loretta and me, mm -hmm. because I saw Loretta to just be nothing more than a pawn mm -hmm. in the hands of some of her advisors. Mm -hmm. And it scares the heck out of me <laughs> when I think about we have an elected official mm -hmm. that has someone like uh, Roy J. Harris whispering to her in one ear, advising her. And if you look at all her pictures, she's out there taking pictures. She's following the same pattern he did. I mean, it's a photo op representative. And it's like if I take enough pictures and show that I've done enough, then I can put the okie doke over on it, you know. And so, and so I see that happening, and that concerns me that Roy J. Harris is one of her closest advisors. And then I look in the other ear, who's over here whispering? And here is uh, former state senator Margaret Carter, who has been uh, lying, who has been two-faced, 
and who has been uh, criticizing, bad-mouthing me ever since I tried to hold her accountable for doing her job. And I think back on that, as I said in the previous show. If Margaret had been a man, I would have approached her and taken her to the woodshed. Yeah. But because she was a woman, because she was older, everybody said, that's Margaret, leave her alone. And I left it alone. Well, my Aunt Bebe said, Aunt Bebe, 33, uh, 83 years old. she coming to town? And, well, Aunt Bebe said that she will come to town because her philosophy is, she said, tell them this. She said, you cannot throw a rock and hide your hand. Mm -hmm. If you're in the middle of age 8 to 80, you cannot throw a rock and hide your hand. Now, if you're under 8, you might get a pass. And she said, if you're over 80, now she can throw a rock, she said, and she get a pass. But Margaret, I think, is in her 70s now. Folks, I should give her a pass. No, she threw rocks. And she's going to get rocks thrown back. Yes. And that's, and well, and, and so anyway, let me finish up on Loretta because I was just getting ready to, to uh, well, so, so, so the thing with Loretta is, again, it concerns me when we talk about leadership and we've had some great leadership. We've already talked about Charles Jordan and the, yeah. and the McCoys in terms of representing our community. But when I see somebody who I think has won, uh, who presents herself as being bourgeois, uh, presents herself as being elitist and presents herself like she was elected queen as opposed to being a county commissioner that's disconcerting that's very disconcerting to me and I look at the people around her and as I said you got Margaret on one side Roy J on the other and somebody said they're related they're cousins I don't know if they are but I know they've been drinking the same Kool-Aid I can tell you that <laughs> because they talk the same trash and so you got them so so that brings me a whole lot of issues and concerns and then I look at the deception in terms of how this issue was taken out to the black sisterhood and to the feminists in the community and mm -hmm. folks jumped on board because people like Margaret was telling them oh this was so bad and all that and again and being a student of history, when I processed this, I couldn't help but to think about how our ancestors were uh, lynched and, and beaten over almost no information. Hmm. One in particular, you know, that everybody knows about is Emmett Till. Emmett Till, a young black man from Chicago, was down south. He was accused of, of whistling at a white woman. By the time the news got around town, uh, the word was he had raped this white woman. And all these white men got together feeling very self-righteous, and they formed their vigilante group. And they went out and kidnapped Emmett Till and killed him, beat him, and uh, disconfigured him so bad that folks did not even want to have an open casket. And his mm -hmm. mother said, no, we're going to open the caskets. Mm -hmm. I want the world to see mm -hmm. what they did to my son. And that was published in Jet Magazine and all over the country. Mm -hmm. And for one of the first times for a lot of people, they started saying, God, how cruel is this? And again, how can you not, when you know your history, start to identify parallels so we don't repeat it? So the parallel to me is very simply, all of a sudden you get a woman who runs around and says, oh, this man called me beautiful. I'm humiliated. I'm offended. I'm being harassed. And without asking any questions, we get all these so-called feminists running out and all the members of the sisterhood, they run out and what they're saying, oh, he needs to be fired. He needs to be crucified. Let's lynch him. Acting just like a vigilante group. And that's the part that concerns me, that we go through these cycles of history. And while we should be able to identify the behaviors of the oppressor and not continue to repeat those patterns, we've got people of all uh, shades and colors who are repeating that behavior of the oppressor. So we got black folks being harder on black folks than even the oppressor was <laughs> because they were put in charge of being overseer. <laughs> then we got white people who now who call themselves the so-called liberal community, the progressive community, and they come out and they want to be vigilantes and be just as hard on yeah. black folks. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was enlightening to me since the last show, I was reading the book by James Weldon Johnson, the autobiography of an ex-colored man, and he framed this so well about how do you compare the North and the South in terms of how they treat African Americans or black folks, and he hit Portland right on the head. Hmm. He said in the North, you got all these Northerners who are for abolition, who want to support the black folks and all this stuff, and for all the right reasons they do and say the right thing, contribute to the white causes and all that, but in the North, they don't have any relationship with black folks, though. They don't know black folks. They don't know you on a day-to-day -day basis and all of that, but, you know, it's like saying, well, I voted for Obama, so mm -hmm. I'm good. 
you know, that's it. They'll they'll support you here, but on the day-to-day basis, some of their behaviors haven't changed. While in the South, you have people, white folks, who will say, no, I don't support that legislation. I don't support all these equal rights and all of this, but they will develop relationships one-on-one with some folks in their neighborhood who work for them or work with them, and they will treat them and bring them in like family. So we living in the North, and what we got is all these progressive white folks who run around and want to tell you how liberal they are and how well in tune they are, and they gave to the right causes, and they voted for President Obama, so therefore they got some license then to turn around and act like the overseer and the oppressor. So when you step out of the sports realm or the entertainment realm into the political realm and the business realm, you a target. And they can ridicule you, they can distort the facts and the history. Point in case, point in case. Quartet restaurant. Quartet Quartet restaurant restaurant. closed within the last couple of weeks. Here in Portland. Here in Portland. Quartet restaurant was a restaurant here in Portland. I keep forgetting our audience is bigger than Portland. (laughs) But it closed here in Portland. There was a group of African Americans forum who were part of the partnership, opened this fabulous restaurant. and, And after a little bit more than a year, they closed up. And there was an article in the Scanner newspaper, and the Scanner newspaper is a black-owned newspaper, and this is why we have to tell our own stories. The Scanner newspaper talked about how this restaurant, in the 14 months it was existing, it had had people there like Stevie Wonder, it had had Spike Lee there, it had had Michael Jordan come and dine there, uh, and, and it talked about how it's unfortunate the restaurant closed, but in reality, Four out of 10 restaurants do close up in their first year. That's right. And this was a business venture. It was a risk. And they knew it when they went into it. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. And, and, but that's how the black press reports the story. Now, let me tell you how the white press reports the story. <laughs> Number one, they don't mention any of these folks who have dined there. These are national black folks uh, who have some clout. They don't mention that. They mention Baruti Arthur was at Quartet, and that's where he called Loretta beautiful. And so, and that's the story. And I'm shocked. Now, how did I get to be as famous as Spike Lee and Michael Jordan? You know, how did I get to be this famous? They put me in that category, but they don't mention them. Well, and this is no owners? difference. Were you one but, of the owners? No, I wasn't in this deal. I sit on the outside and watch this. And the thing that, that shocked me, Bruce, is one of the owners, one of the partners in the business, Invests $70,000 and then turn around and tries to sue the partnership for $350,000. Who was it? Who was it? You want to take a guess? Rope it dope. This was Rope a Dope. This was old Rope a Dope. Roy J. Harris. Roy J. Harris. Y'all need to know. And, and, and some of y'all have already gone to the website, the Oregon Secretary of State website. I said, go look at it and see how many nonprofits he had his name associated with. And people have come back and they've been shocked. And depending how you count it, it's somewhere between 40 to 50. Well, a few of those are for-profit organizations, but I just don't know. If I was so into working for nonprofits and had a passion, maybe I'll start two or three nonprofits. I'm going to work. But do I start a dozen? Do I start two dozen? Do I start three dozen? What the heck is that about? In fact, some of the folks told me not to say this, but I'm on a roll. So I'm going to go ahead. I got to say this. Go and see, they, they told me. So this is the nonprofit thing. I'm committed to working with nonprofits. I'm committed to working with the community. And so I was thinking about this whole thing that went down. And I was thinking about Roy J. Harris. You know, and, and some of y'all may know, he threatened to sue me for $50 million. In fact, when I go back to Compton now, y'all heard about 50 cents. They call me 50 mil. 50 they, mil. they call me 50, so 50 mil. mil. I, I got a new nickname. Oh they call me 50, 50 mil when I go back to Compton. Oh, yeah. and I said, But he hasn't dropped a lawsuit, and I'm waiting for him because there's a lot of people nationally saying drop the lawsuit. It's just going to even bring more attention to this situation. That's what we need because ever since I identified the wickedness and treachery that's going on in some of these high places, you see the local media hasn't reported it. Yep. They don't want to talk yep. about yep. it. They're trying to sweep it under the rug because I started calling out some of their house Negroes who they pat on the head and who feeds them the story that they want and who's going to tell them what they want to hear and who's going to go around and try to take out the good people who are trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it. In fact, I have to tell you, I was watching this movie Grudge Match with Robert De Niro and Sylvester Stallone and I thought that was so good. They was getting in there having this grudge match and I said, you know what? And I said, and I ain't trying to be the angry black man. I said, but I want to challenge Roy J to a boxing match. And we uh. go three rounds and we do this for charity. We do this for any nonprofit. And I, I thought about it and I said, you know, because I personally, you know, I, I 
Yeah, I, I said, you know, I box at Mad Dish, I box at Scott, I, Scott Community Center. You know, I've had my share of street fights. I fought Taekwondo tournaments here yeah, in Portland, right, right, Vancouver, right, right. Seattle. That'd be a good and so one. I, and so I know. But charity, I, kind of a charity. We're doing for charity. charity. We can deal. sell tickets. That's I know right, I can right, sell tickets. Right, but right, but then, right. Bruce, you know, I'll promote it. But check this out. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. I'll promote it. I'll promote it. And I even thought about it. And we can get Commander Modica to referee the fight. There you go. But if Roy don't want to do this, then I'll do this. Roy. Get David Austin and Nick Fish. I'll go one round with each one of y'all. Mm. So y'all can each get a round. Mm. And then I said, well, I know I'm dealing with a group of cowards, and they probably don't want to do this. And so let me do this. Roy, I'll put all three of y'all in the ring at the same time. Mm. And we're going to do this for charity. And let's mm. give it to your favorite charity. Right. Now, my family right. said, don't do that, Baruti. That's so ghetto. But hey, sometimes mm. you got to go back to mm. where you came mm. from. I'll be back up. Okay, brother. <laughs> 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 but, okay, I'm sorry for that long no, no, winded no, answer. No, 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 no. I want to, another point. Yeah, I, the last show that we did, remember, we, I talked to you about that. I'd gotten an email, and you'd gotten an email from from some guy from back east, mm -hmm. threatening us, mm -hmm. threatening you and mm -hmm. me, yeah. from the standpoint, i.e., from uh, that, that we're, we're doing something in regards to Project Stay Clean. What do you about that, Peter? Well, well, I I, I think it's another, uh, no. it's uh, if I look I at know. it, to me. It's just it's, it. it's, it's, it's part of the okie doke when yep. you've got people yep. out there yep. who are operating under this illusion that things are a certain way. And when uh, that is challenged and questioned, yeah. people respond and they get very defensive. Yeah. And so, uh, as I said, you know, it, it, the person inquiring, taking shots at you, taking shots at me. Yeah. I mean, this is the modus yeah. operandi. That's Latin for y'all who don't know. <laughs> modus operandi <laughs> means this is the method of operation. I took Latin at Compton yeah. High School. Yeah. I know the five declension. But the modus operandi here, it, 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 it's, it's, it's old yeah. and it's dead. It needs to stop. Where if somebody doesn't go along with you, you act like the leader of some third world uh, country and I got to take them out. So number one is you get threatened with a lawsuit, you know, women will sue you yeah. and most people back off because folks don't want to lose yeah. a little bit of kittles and bits that yeah. they've accumulated. So the threat of a lawsuit keeps folks. And I've even heard people from the state saying, well, we can't do this and this because we might get sued. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you, ain't, you can't do the right thing because somebody might sue you. Mm -hmm. So the threat of a lawsuit. The second thing is, it's defamation of character. Yeah. It's like we're going to destroy you. We're going to demonize you. And those are the folks who have come forward to me saying, let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you what happened to me because I didn't go along to get along. And that's when I said I get concerned because I start seeing this group of people. It's not that they just stepped on my toe because oh, yeah. I even said if they stepped on my toe, I could shrug it off. I keep going. You know, I ain't going to whine about it. But when I start seeing the pattern of behavior, the modus mm -hmm. operandi, mm -hmm. that they're stepping on toes of people in the community who are trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just like, oh, wait a minute. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes somebody got to stand up and say, stop. Some, we got to do something different. And so this is part of my charge from a retirement standpoint is just making sure that we we get the truth out there to the truth seekers and that we get the knowledge keepers, those elders who, who, who are ready to do something. We need to come together and start speaking up. In mm -hmm. fact, I even thought about, we I'll get a group of elders and get a station wagon and we go drive down the street with some belts and let's jump out on all these young boys with their pants sagging and whoop yeah. their tails and tell yeah. them, pull yeah. your yeah. pants yeah, right up. On. You know, I, so I'm going to be a militant <laughs> uh, grandfather. I'm going to be militant going into my old age. You know, I'm tired of doing a whole lot of talking. We got to take some action. Yes. You know, Rudy, th this is this is wow. I mean, I mean, what it does is kind of some some of the some points in regards to the this uh, the issue of the lawsuits and things of that nature. I'm still I'm still reminded of the NAACP. You know, it's a mm -hmm. valuable organization aspect mm -hmm. of it, and it was a kind of a structure in terms of a need. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember when I was vice president of, of the organization, and Roy J was the president of the organization, and all of a sudden uh, uh, we had this issue with reference to Safeway, mm -hmm. and Safeway was basically selling alcohol, if you will, to youth, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so all of a sudden, that's, they went on the defense aspect of it, and the next thing I know is that we'll, we'll get a contribution of about $5,000 mm. at the end of ACP. Mm. And normally when you get monies, you have mm -hmm. to go and vet that money to national. Right, yeah. And definitely. all of a sudden, you, you we go through that process, and mm -hmm. next thing you know, I was jumped on. Mm. And next thing you know, all of a sudden, uh, the end of on by who? Uh, by Mr. Roy J. Oh, Roy J. and others. You know, because mm -hmm. Roy J. had given them, uh, well, like the Safeway had given them f favors, if you will. Mm -hmm. Like, all due respect to Bernie and Roy J. for that mm -hmm. matter. But the bottom line mm -hmm. is that from the NAACP aspect of it, the, the, end of, the organization came to town. They checked all of this situation out. And I'll just be just briefly, as a result of that, they threw it out of the mm -hmm. NAACP. 
Well, and then someone, I got, and then all of a sudden there was a lawsuit with me, and actually I had a lawsuit react, by who? Uh, by Mr. Roy J. Okay. okay. All right. In fact, someone broke into my car, you know, about and, and threw out the papers and whatever, you know. And, and, oh man, I mean, it just went on and on. That's but deep. So I, I just want to throw that out there, just yeah. as a little bit. But it, you know, it didn't avoid me as long as you don't touch me or my family. I'm yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, oh yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> well, well, uh, yeah. And then you got hit with a lawsuit, as I recall. You were probably one of the persons early on that he hit you with a million oh, yeah. a dollar oh, yeah. lawsuit oh, yeah. or oh, yeah. something. Oh, yeah. Made all kind of news. And, and I had even talked to. Uh, a former reporter from uh, the Oregonian, uh, yeah. Renee Mitchell. Oh, yeah. And if you yeah. guys remember, she did a series of articles on the NAACP yeah, and did. Roy J. Yeah, she did. And, and she told me firsthand, she said, Baruti, she found no basis to yeah. this lawsuit that no. Roy J. No. Harris had filed against you. Yeah, and right. she reported That's that. Right. And she right. took a lot of heat in the That's community right. because she was really telling the truth right. about about the illusion, right. about the game. Right. And a lot of folks weren't ready to hear that right. and right. uh, asked her not to do that, mm -hmm. and she backed off. And now, again, you know, years later, uh, the pattern of behavior, it hasn't changed. Well, you know, in all due respect, Rudy, really, that's why you're here. And in all due respect, Rudy, really, that's what we need a clean we need the clean house mm, we need a clean we, slate. we got a clean that's right. we need the clean slate yeah we need a clean slate yeah. big time okay yeah. and, and so I, I really respect you for being here and making the statement and you're going to be living here for now mm. and in fact i'll be right up front with that's one of my rationale for running for office oh okay. that is my rationale mm -hmm. for running for multnomah county uh, district number two mm -hmm. which encompasses portland okay mm -hmm. and then my focus is going to be on veterans seniors uh -huh. and the youth Okay. okay, and other issues. I got okay. other issues at the table. Well, well, let me ask you a question, Bruce, a, a, a good one, because this yes, is sir. one that I'm sure you've been asked as well as I've been asked, and and, and I want to answer this question yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. But sure. the question I, I hear people saying, well, we've got four black people running for county commissioner in District 2. What's wrong with that? Can't they get together? Why are they in conflict? Could you respond to that statement? I mean, all I did was file. Uh-huh. I think I have the background, and as far as I'm concerned, the other individuals that are running have, have their issues. And mm -hmm. it's like anything else. If you if you feel that you're responsible enough that you want to, that's the American way. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if you if you feel more comfortable with me, you elect me, and mm -hmm. vice versa. But this business of saying all four are just blacks, it's, it's ridiculous. What about other races? Thank you, thank you so much. Huh? Well, well, I can tell you, I, and we hadn't talked about this, but what you <laughs> said is in line with me. I. Uh, I look at the fact that I've spent a lot of time working in trying to uh, save the democracy and to Gee. get black folks in. And who can say, who's going to tell us that we can't compete against it? We're, so, we're not so monolithic. We all see things the one way. Exactly. So I think it's great. I think it's fabulous oh. and more power to everybody who's in the race. And I hope more African Americans step up and, and, and follow your example. And that's leadership. That's what it's all about. Yes. Okay, fine. Any other lasting point? By the way, unfortunately, you're going to have to come back. I hate to put it this Man, way. Man, I, no, I'm sorry. I am, I'm sorry. I am, you, you got more. I mean, we, Got, yeah. No, no, you got to come Well, back. I'm going to finish my book. When I come back, I'm going to okay. come back right. and promote right. my right. book right. and right. what's in the right. book. Right. And but I, I do have more to say. But but here's here's the last thing I, I want to okay. say, you know, and, and that I really did want to uh, come and, and be a little bit more lighthearted today because, again, I get passionate and I was outright angry or, or should I say, uh, filled with righteous indignation yes. about this. But this is the one thing I really want to be real clear about uh, in the article. It was an article in the paper and they called me the firebrand community leader. And I've never seen myself that way, but I'm okay being called a firebrand. And the reason is this, because it's like what James Baldwin said, no more water, the fire next time. And it's what you said. You mess with me, you mess with That's my right. family, right. no more water. It's going to be the fire next time. I've been as nice as I can be. And all my family in L.A. saying, Baruti, you're too nice. And so I've been as nice as I can be on this. But you come after me, you come after my family, you, you made a big That's mistake. Right. And you're going to get That's right. the fire next time. And I think on that same note, I'm going to go right back to Tom McCall, former Governor Tom McCall. Visit, but don't stay. Mm -hmm. If you want to live in this community, fine. Mm -hmm. But if you've just been staying, and that's what a, lot, a number of these so-called leaders have been, been there. They've Carpet just baggers. been staying. Carpetbaggers, yeah. big time. Mm -hmm. We want you out of here. Yeah, thank we you. want you out of here. Do whatever. You cannot do out of here by saying, hey, I'm going to revert to living as opposed to staying. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Okay. Brody, this has been just a pleasure. It really has been yeah. a pleasure. And again, I want to say, I'm sure you probably want to say happy Easter to everybody. I mean, you, you dressed happy up Easter, happy Gordon. resurrection day. And, 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 I, and I would hope also, too, that, um, you know, I, I'll be right up front with you. You know, you, you made the point about Charles Jordan. Uh, he, was, he was an icon, you know, as you know, mm -hmm. in our particular community. And that's the beginning, if you will, of the leadership stuff that we're talking about. And I would say to both, in all due respect, the, the African-American newspaper, both the Portland Observer and, and, the, and the Scanner newspaper, please consider putting commission, former Commissioner Charles Jordan on the front page. Give him the right due that he's due. Because in all due respect, it means a lot for our young African-American males. Mm -hmm. Too often we tend to forget that. 
So please consider doing it. And I'm not trying to take this in a negative way, but this is a start. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new start, and we need them. We need them in it to tell the story. Tell the truth. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay, fine. Well, again, again, folks, thank you very, very much. We really appreciate the fact that you were here with us. And next week, join us again. We're probably going to have a very exciting show. We've also put the challenge out there to get the chairman of the Republican Party and the chairman of the Democratic Party to be on this show to talk about the issues of this state and the various communities. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Again, ha have a good one. Take care. God bless.